Many presentations of domain testing would stop right here. After all, we've looked at equivalence classes, we've looked at boundaries, we've looked at the classical equivalence class table, and we've applied them all to a simple example. What more do we need? Well, so far, all we've tested is the input filter. Input filter tests ask whether the code that accepts values into a dialog will accept valid values and filter out invalid values. It's not inappropriate to test input filters. When I unit test my own code, I pay very careful attention to my input filters. But as system testers, we have to take the analysis further. For example, if you give the program the biggest value it's supposed to handle, that big value is a boundary case in a lot of places. Everywhere that the program uses it, this is the biggest value it's supposed to be. What does the program do with it? What are the risks if the value turns out to be too big for some other part of the program? Let me illustrate this with a test at page width. So far, our first tests have been with an empty slide. Now, my experience with testers that I've supervised and with students in my courses, commercial courses and university courses, including students who consider themselves absolute experts. Almost everybody tests the page setup dialog with an empty slide. You can't see much with an empty slide. All you're really testing is the input filter. If you're going to test how the program resizes slides, you have to consider how it resizes the things that are on the slides, not just the empty slide. So for example, consider a slide with text on it, like this one. What happens if we resize it? When I stretch the slide to 56 inches, it seems to look appropriate, but it's hard to say because the letters are so small compared to the width of the slide. I can't read them, so I can't tell whether anything's been changed or dropped. So instead of going to the extreme value, let's go to a narrower value that makes a big stretch, but lets me see what the text actually is that got stretched. So here's the original slide again. This is the one we're resizing. When we stretch the slide to 18 inches, you can see that the slide's gotten wider, but you can also read the text. As you can see, all the text is there. The text is also wrapping correctly on this slide. It doesn't go to the end of the slide, but it's not supposed to. I always leave about a third of a slide blank so that I can put the video there. Within that constraint, it's not overstretching the text box. Within that constraint, the text is fitting in the text box and wrapping just like it's supposed to. Now let's try a table instead of basic text. Here's the table, and here's the table on a stretched slide. It looks fine. Now try a graphic. I'm not sure this is appropriate. The program didn't change the text. The individual letters all look the same as they did before. But the program stretches the graphic. So when it's stretching, it handles text differently from graphics. Let's try it with a little wider page width. The text still looks fine, but that graphic looks terrible. In my next test, I'll create a table in another program and import that. Now when I stretch the slide, it stretches the text in the table as if the table was a graphic. On a 25 inch wide slide, this table looks terrible. I'll leave it to you to decide whether these inconsistencies are bugs or features. But if you only test with blank slides, you won't see any of this. In our thesis research, Samya gave students four days of instruction on domain testing. She gave them lots of practice exercises that focused on different types of data and combinations of data. She explicitly told people during her lectures to check what the program does with the data you give it, but she didn't explicitly practice them on that. So at the end of the course, she gave her students an exam. Most of her questions looked just like practice exercise problems, and they all did really well with those. But she gave one final question that stretched further than her practice. That used the PowerPoint page setup dialog box. Now at that time, PowerPoint distorted text like it distorts graphics now. So if you stretched a slide wide, the text all distorted too. And if you stretched it back and forth a few times, you could crash the program, get a blue screen. Not one student saw any of these problems. They all tested with empty slides. In domain testing, when you're stuffing the program with boundary values, if you don't ask what the program's going to do with those data, and if you don't ask what the program's going to do that to, you're going to miss critical bugs. I'm going to pause and summarize what the lecture has illustrated so far. The first task in domain testing is to decide what variable you're testing. We focused on page width. The next step is to figure out what type of variable you're testing. Our examples variable is probably a floating point number, but we still have more to learn about it. What we know so far is that it accepts numbers below 1 and turns them into 1. 
It accepts numbers above 56 and turns them into 56. It accepts numbers with three digits after the decimal, rounds them to two digits after the decimal, and it transforms all the inputs that we've tested to numbers between 1 and 56. But how many digits does it accept? What does it do with negative numbers? What about non-numbers? So we know a lot about the input domain for this variable, but we don't yet know its full extent. The next question we considered is how the program uses this variable. And the answer is it changes the width of the slides. The next step that I list in the slide is partitioning into equivalence classes. You partition a set when you divide it into subsets. The example created three subsets. Inputs less than 1, inputs between 1 and 56, and inputs greater than 56. I showed these in a table and emphasized the boundaries of each partition. Notice we don't have anything on the table that says try stretching the slide with a graphic on the slide or a table on the slide. What this table doesn't show, what this type of table doesn't show well, is tests for the consequences of your data choices. So that's the end of the summary. Together these steps provide a rough idea of what domain testing is. Here's a more precise definition of domain testing with definitions of some of the other terms I've been emphasizing so far. There's one new word here. In the description of domain testing I say test using best representatives instead of boundary values. Most of the time, boundaries are the best representatives. I'll explain what more is involved in the idea of a best representative pretty soon. A couple slides ago, I noted that we hadn't fully analyzed the input domain, and I mentioned the number of digits after the decimal point. Here's where we draw the distinction between primary dimensions and secondary dimensions. So far, our example is focused on the primary dimension for page width. The primary dimension specifies the width of the slides, and our permissible widths are from 1 to 56. Values below 1 are too small, values above are too big. The number of digits you can enter into the page width field is an example of a secondary dimension. Unless you're a tester, you're not entering numbers into the page width field to see how many digits you can cram after the decimal point. You're entering numbers to specify the width of a slide. That's the difference between a primary dimension and its secondaries. The primary dimension reflects the reason you're entering the data into the field. The secondaries reflect all of the other ways that the input can vary. The ASCII code helps us characterize another secondary dimension. If you don't remember ASCII, go back to your notes from the Foundations course. But in brief, any character you can type on a traditional keyboard has an ASCII code. Letters, numbers, punctuation, they all have ASCII codes between 0 and 255. The codes from 48 to 57 are for digits. 48 is the code for 0, 57 is the code for 9. The ASCII code for capital A is 65. So in terms of the range from 48 to 57, 65 is too big. So there's no good reason to enter letters into a page width field, but you might. And if you do enter a letter, the program has to deal with it. That means we've got a dimension here. It runs from 0 to 255 with valid inputs in the range of 48 to 57. If they're not digits, they're not valid inputs. Except for the minus sign and the space and the decimal point. We have to deal with them too on that dimension. Here's some more examples of secondary dimensions. How many spaces can you type in front of the number that you're going to enter? How many spaces can you type between any digits that you enter? What about minus signs? How many of those can you enter? You can show secondary dimensions on a traditional boundary analysis table. When I do this, I start with the primary dimension, I work through it completely, and then I work through the secondary dimensions one at a time. Different variables have different types of primary dimensions. Page width is an example of a floating point variable. Other variables are integers, or dollars and cents, or strings. You can do a domain analysis with any of these, but not with binary variables. If the only two values of a variable are yes or no, you're going to have to test both of them. Neither one is equivalent to the other, so you can't create equivalence classes to sample from. 